Hi, everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about remote control, roadside picnic, the judging eye, and determined. So starting out with remote control, this takes place in Ghana, either in present times or in slightly near future. And we have this young girl, this young girl named Fatima, and we follow her from ages four or five up until the age of 14. She is this young, beautiful girl with chubby cheeks. She has a fox companion. So you get this image of beauty and innocence and childlike charm who happens to become the angel of death. This happens when she is magically gifted the seed that falls from the sky. It imbues her with this power to glow green. And when she glows green, she causes death and destruction to anyone who is in her proximity. It also gives her the power to make technology malfunction if she puts her hand on certain electronic items. They no longer work. And at first, she is unable to control this power. Over time, she gains more and more control. But it causes a lot of heartache and destruction a lot of consequences that she is not psychologically ready to deal with. And I think one of the things that is so powerful about this novella, without giving away too much because it is short, is the way that Nedio Korfor plays with contrast, with juxtaposition, because we have this very young, innocent character who's given this very huge godly power. And it's a power she doesn't, as I said before, that she doesn't know what to do with this power. She doesn't know how to manage it and how to deal with the repercussions of this power. And it also has this element of technology. So you see a lot of electronics in the story, a lot of tech, modern day technology or, futurist, or futuristic technology. And you also see that contrasted with folklore as she is this legend. She is this living legend called Sankofa. Um, so the angel of death or the adopted angel of death, I should say. I think that's what it is. So people know about her and there are stories to being told about her. At the same time, there are certain electronic items like drones that are gathering data. And I think that that's also interesting too because we, we, we associate gathering data with accuracy and information and yet there is no accurate story to depict her story, but you're following her true story when you read the book. And so it's a really creative endeavor. I thought it was a really creative creative story, creative novella. A lot of charm to the prose, very clear prose, but a lot of charm to it. I love the descriptions of modern day Ghana as having all this technology, as I mentioned, but also having little cultural touches such as the attire, the types of foods they eat, the fact that she wears these hoop earrings. I, I thought it was very well written. I liked that it's sci-fi with a little bit of whimsy and wonder in it as well. Next book to mention is Roadside Picnic. And now this was first published in 1972. The translation that I read was published in 2012. It has a forward by Ursula K. Le Guin, and I highly recommend not reading that forward until you read the book because there are major spoilers in that forward. It's excellent though. That forward that she wrote is so good. Uh, it gives a lot of context to this first contact story. Uh, the title itself, the humor in the story is a little tongue-in-cheek, I would say. We um, essentially are given the backstory through an opening interview in this book, an opening interview with this Nobel award-winning scientist who talks about how aliens came to visit the earth in six locations called zones. They came, they left, nobody knows why they came, why they left, but they came. And in these zones, they left certain artifacts. So researchers are preoccupied with trying to understand these artifacts, finding out if they could be of use for our current culture, current society, so there's even an institute of research that is dedicated to understanding these artifacts. And these are forbidden zones, yet there are these people called stalkers in this book who go into those zones, steal these alien artifacts, and sell them on the black market for profit. And so we follow one of these stalkers named Redrick at the beginning of the story. It's an interesting story in that the first chapter, there are four chapters in addition to that opening interview I mentioned. In the first chapter, it's told in first person present tense, and then it switches to third person past tense. And I don't know if that's a translation choice or if the original story was written in such a way, but we follow Redrick, and he is not the most um, noble protagonist. He has some serious flaws. He has a problem with alcohol. He treats women horribly. Um, he's just not a all around great guy, but... Uh, 
either way, it was interesting following his journey because in the first chapter, he goes into the zone. It's not his first time. And there are serious consequences that happens to his friend who goes with him. And I won't say much more than that, except that there are some really strange, surreal things, consequences to people who go through the zone and come back. Some really strange phenomenon happens in this story. And in chapter three, we get the big reveal. We get the big idea of what the roadside picnic is and some of the bigger themes in the story that is given to you via conversation between the scientist who opens the book and another character. And I thought it was really interesting to look at that conversation and look back at the opening of the book and just put that together in context. The fourth chapter is also really good. I thought the fourth chapter was my favorite in the book. I thought that that was where those ideas really had, I don't know, at that fourth chapter had more depth and context because of the ideas that were re revealed in the third chapter. Now I'll say as far as my reading experience is concerned, this was not a, a story that emotionally gripped me. I actually stumbled a little bit in the beginning trying to get my grounding. I found some of the movement in the first chapter a little bit abrupt. And then I got into it more and more as I read on. I noted certain touches of atmosphere, specifically in the second chapter, going on to third and fourth chapter especially. And I really loved the ending. And this was a book, even though I said it didn't emotionally grip me, it was a book I enjoyed more and more as I read on. And it's one that I really appreciated when I looked back on it. But I don't consider this a favorite read. I think this is really one of those stories, though, that looks critically at first contact, looks critically at this idea that humans are the most important thing in the universe. So I think this book pairs really well with Solaris, which I read earlier this year. Solaris, as I mentioned in a previous video, kind of going off that theme, too, about humans not being the big deal. And then also In Ascension, which In Ascension was inspired largely by Solaris. So In Ascension, I think, also looks at this idea of flipping that trope about first contact stories. And I'll say that I enjoyed my time reading Solaris and In Ascension much, much more than this book, but I still am glad I read it. It gave me a lot to think about, and it's a book I could easily see enjoying more upon reread because I did find there were a lot of little seeds I could look back and appreciate more as I read on in the book. And I usually appreciate that experience in any book. Now to talk about my favorite book in the month of May and a book that's competing to be my favorite book of the year at this point, And that is The Judging Eye by R. Scott Baker. Wow. I read the Prince of Nothing trilogy a couple of years ago and really loved it, especially book two. That was my favorite one, The Warrior Prophet. And I can definitely see how Baker is upping his game in Aspect Emperor. This book was so fascinating. It is incredibly dark. I think that Baker is a master. He is a master of mood. He creates this intensely dark mood and somehow allows gradation to get darker and darker and darker, not just in atmosphere and setting, but also in psychology. This book explores betrayal. There is a whole passage on betrayal that is my favorite passage in the book. I wish I could share the passage here, but it might be a little spoilery. This particular passage, though, it gives betrayal a life. It gives it a soul, in a sense, and it, it just personifies it in a way that I've never I've never read a betrayal described that way before. So I love that he looks at certain certain experiences in human in human nature and he will just pry it open to its depths and i told philip in our discussion that i feel exposed when i read baker and he goes into the darkness he goes there he goes into the darkest parts you can possibly imagine but we also explore self-loathing um imposter syndrome, I, I think you could say that. This book has nods to Blood Meridian and Lord of the Rings, and I see a little bit of Children of Dune in this book as well, just a very morbid, twisted version of those three books, even though Blood Meridian is already quite morbid and dark. Uh, this particular book is powerful. Uh, we follow different perspectives, and I thought each perspective was so compelling, so fascinating. I loved the way the book was structured, loved the epigraphs. There were so many quotable lines in this book. It just has so much gravitas. That's the best word I can use to describe 
bigger. It pulls you in like a vortex. You feel like you feel the gravity of what he's talking about. So it's amazing to have that in a fantasy world. I, I find that fascinating because in fantasy, you have all types of fantasy, right? You have a lot of light, fluffy fantasy, like cozy fantasy. But when you read Baker, you feel like you're reading a real lived in world with real characters. And I just can't get over the psychology, the way he's able to depict that. So I'm rambling on and on. If you've read the book, please check out our wonderful discussion here on my channel. And I'm very eager to start The White Luck Warrior. I may have already started the beginning of that book because I've been fascinated <laughs> by this journey so far. I had to switch locations because it was getting quite a bit windy outside, but I was going to say that Baker really enjoys exploring free will, whether we have any or not. And those who read Baker's books are probably pretty convinced that at least he thinks that we don't have free will. And that's a good segue to talk about the other book I read in the month of May, which is Determined by Robert Sapolsky. This is a nonfiction book dealing with the science of life without free will. So as the subtitle suggests, The Science of Life Without Free Will, Sapolsky is looking at human behavior from a neuroscience perspective, as well as quantum physics and evolution, all types of different perspectives to understand this concept of free will and to show how that probably doesn't exist, at least from what he's been able to find in science. Now, I am not a scientist. I am not the person to refute his claims in this book. I'm just not a specialist in the areas that he discusses. I do appreciate the way he writes about these topics, though, because even somebody like me can follow his train of thought. I have to say, though, I did struggle a little bit more in this book than I did in his book, Behave. Behave is a book about the biology of humans that are best and worst. And in that book, he brings forth a greater picture of human behavior by looking at it from several different lenses, from a neuroscience lens, endocrinology is weaved in, psychology, sociology, history, evolution, genes, environment. And even in that book, you get to a point where you think, wow, this kind of suggests we don't have free will. And in this book, Determine, he really tries to hammer that point home. So in the first half of the book, he's making that case. In the second half of the book, he starts to go into what that would mean if we actually accepted that we have no free will. What would that mean for our justice system? What would that mean for the way that we observe human behavior? And I thought it, it built a case for compassion, oddly, for certain people who are struggling with certain mental afflictions or understanding privilege and how that plays a role in how people are where they are. And whether you agree with whether we have free will or not, I think we can all recognize that privilege has a place in our lives and is something to be acknowledged. And so this is a very complicated topic. It's very controversial, but I did appreciate reading this book, even if it could be refuted, even if people poke holes in it and we later find out, no, this is all wrong. The field of neuroscience grows day by day. I feel like that field is changing so fast. I was talking about this with a friend recently, or actually I was talking about this in my Discord recently, about how it wasn't too long ago that we believed in things such as right brain equals creative, left brain equals logic, and some people are more right brain people, and some people are more left brain people. Things such as that we believed not too long ago, and we have learned so much more since then about how the brain actually works, and there's so much being discovered every day in that field. So it's hard to follow and make a strong case for anything in my opinion, but I did find his case pretty compelling and I really find the topic fascinating. So if you're interested in this topic, even if you've already decided we have free will as the Rush song suggests, I still highly recommend checking this book out if you're interested in the topic because it was very compelling. And that's about it. So please let me know in the comment section below if you've read any of the books I've mentioned, if you're planning to read any of the books I've mentioned. Thank you so much for watching and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.